It's time for a change. God offers His people a change that can only be described as spiritual awakening. Join Jackson First Baptist as we discover the path of spiritual awakening. Take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. Let me say again, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that what's happening in our world is God's shake-up. God's shake-up is for His wake-up, and maybe in your life right now, God is shaking you up, trying to wake you up for what He wants to do in your life. Let me give you a verse of Scripture that was part of our reading plan this week. Isaiah 43 and 19, here's what God says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now listen to this. It shall spring forth, do you perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. When God does something in the life of His people, He has to, first of all, to rivet you, to agitate you where you are. Because if you're not agitated about where you are, you'll always be where you are. So when God begins to agitate your life, He will bring this announcement, maybe through a friend, it may be through an accident, it may be through a trial, it may be through the Word of God itself, through a circumstance, where that God says, hey, something's wrong. And then there comes that moment of acceptance. Now, there are some things that God may ask us to do that we may on the front end say that's ridiculous. Now, I know there are some things that are ridiculous in the world. Can you amen? There are some things in your life, let's just be honest, that are not going to happen. But there are other things, dear friend, if God calls them to be, if you'll just be obedient to what He says, God will work in your life. Now, think about this. The title of the message today is Unlikely People. God specializes in working with unlikely people. And some of you may be like the man in the moment when he heard the terrible news. He heard the news that his own daughter had died. He had asked Jesus to come. He said, Jesus, will you go and heal my daughter? Jesus doesn't even speak. He just gets up and goes. That's our love and Savior. And when, she heard, when he heard the news that his daughter had died, someone said this, don't trouble him anymore. Don't trouble the master anymore. But look on your screen. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. Do you know within a few minutes, Jesus made his way on to where the young lady was, made everybody else get out except the mom and dad, and he raised her from the dead. I know America's in the ash heap right now. I know that many churches are in the ash heap right now. I know some people are distracted right now. But remember what Tony Evans taught us? Tony Evans taught us when we were in the book of Romans in chapter 8. I quoted from him. He said this, if all you ever see is what there is to see, that's all you'll ever see. But if you'll go beyond what you see, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it was our reading this morning. Here's what God said. God says that your eye have not seen, nor ear has heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those who love him. Spurgeon said this, many people wrongly think that's for heaven, but he's talking about now. For when the Holy Spirit awakens you and reveals to your life, you suddenly realize God's pointing a finger, a godly finger, not an ungodly finger, not a wrathful finger, but a loving finger to you and he says you're the unlikely person that I'm going to use there are two things that God's laid upon my heart to tell you this in the beginning one is this write it down God specializes in doing amazing things with unlikely people you may be one of those that like Nehemiah that's unlikely you may be one of those like Malachi that's unlikely you may be be like the the person that God would use that that they never thought they would be like the young lady I read about that got burdened for God And she began just a little simple website raising money for a particular ministry. And she's raised to this day, a little young lady, she's raised over $2 million. $2 million. God specializes with unlikely people. But secondly, God does this. God specializes in doing amazing things in unlikely times. Now, this is an unlikely time. It's raining outside in the Baptist church. So if you get anybody to come in the Baptist church on Sunday morning, that's an unlikely time. And so there's a good crowd in both services today. It's unlikely that we've just come out of a pandemic. What can we do? It's an unlikely time, friend, that economy is imploding. Inflation is rising. It's an unlikely time. Maybe you're sick. Maybe today that you've got struggles, you've got trials, you've got tribulations. It's an unlikely time. We've gone to a world war. Churches are imploding. It's an unlikely time. But we've got a likely God to do something in unlikely times if we are willing to do it. So let me ask you this question. How far will you go with God? Just how far will you go with God? 
Just how do you believe that God can do in a church here in Jackson, Georgia, where you have gathered together today? I believe this with all my heart. God has shown me too much in my lifetime for me to believe anything but that God has called me for this time. I wasn't born in the 1800s. I wasn't born in the early 1900s. I was born for this time and for this place and for you as a people. And today I'm asking you this, to become one of the unlikely people no matter your age, no matter your circumstance and be used by God in an awakening moment today. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by all of that? There are some things that you and I are going to have to deal with today. They're not on the screen. They're, they're not in your notes now, but I'm going to put them before you as we go through. Some of you today are going to have to come to a place that you accept your personal assignment. Now, I could spend two weeks with you, day in and day out. We might break for coffee. We might break to eat a snack or two. Might lay up on these pews for an hour or so, and we would meet two weeks together, and I might not ever name your assignment, but you know what it is. And so I'm telling you today, some of you came in here, and some of you have forgotten the assignment that God has for you. Some of you have gotten locked up in the wilderness of this world and in the, in the issues of this life. Some of you gotten locked up in your flesh, and you have forgotten, but God's going to call you back to your personal assignment. Some of you today are going to have to come to the place that you step into the power of God. And that means you're going to have to adjust your life. God can't use a troubled heart. God cannot use a heart that is busy with its own things. God cannot use a sinful lifestyle that does not change. Some of you today, God's going to speak to you differently than he does to anybody else. And there's something in your life that you won't let go of. And God says, you can't go with me until you let go of what you're holding on to. I don't know what that is. I don't have a clue. I don't even have time. The clock's ticking to say what that is. But God knows and you know. Others of you today, you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to lean in and do battle under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to get out of your flesh, out of your way, the ways you've done it before, and do battle the way God wants you to do. There may be a preacher here, a preacher listening on, online. You have prepared all your stuff. You've planned everything to the T. You know it to the minute, but you haven't been used by the Spirit of God. A Sunday school teacher may need to start being used by the Spirit of God. Others of you, wherever you are, it's time that you get out of yourself and let the anointing that's, that's reserved for God's people to be used by you. Some of you are like, no, I don't have a clue what that is. Only God can straighten that out. And lastly, some of you are going to have to do this. You're going to have to be willing to lay your life on the line. Some of you are going to have to put up your life and listen to me. Some of you are going to have to make a decision. If I die, I die. Some of you are going to have to say it's not about the length of my life. It is about the impact of my life. It's not about the, the timing. It is about God's timing. And some of you today, you've got things against you, and you say, my health is not where it needs to be. That's okay, friend. Use what you got. The Holy Spirit will do the rest. Others of you say, I don't have the education. Use what you got. God will do the rest. Some of you say, I don't have the money. I don't have the time. Friend, God owns it all, and I'm telling you today, you need to lean in. So today, what we are going to do, we follow Nehemiah, who God in 53 days turned around a whole nation. 53 days. Build a wall could not be built in 100 years. He was God's man. Count me in. Malachi had proclaimed that God was going to send the Messiah if they would repent. And they didn't repent. And for 400 years, they held on to one thing, that God was going to raise up a man, and when he would come, right in behind him would be the Messiah. You're in chapter 3 now in verse 1, and you're ready for it. The Bible says, in those days, now say that with me, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. Now let me tell you just really quickly about those days. Those days were 400 years after Israel had been back in the land for 100 years. When they came back into the land, the Medes and the Persians were divided in their leadership. After them would come Alexander the Great, and he would take over the world. He would live shortly after that. And then the Romans would come, and they would put down Greece. They would rule the world. Politically, Rome was on the throne. 400 years, we find from Josephus, that Jewish historian, he said this, can you imagine a group of people going to church every day and God saying to them, I'm going to do something but nothing happened can you imagine that you say you're in a church by the grace of God where things happen I want you to know where we are right now today I put this message together a year ago God knows what he's doing when we went into the pandemic we were starting to go through the book of Revelation together that a year earlier God had put me to write a book in don't tell me God is not right on time so you're in a church where God's doing things but imagine going every week and you're holding on to a promise the book of Malachi ends with a promise that the Messiah would come. And week after week and year after year, generation after generation, they'd be born and they'd die. And nothing except God was at work. And some of you come into this place and it's been a long time 
since you truly heard the voice of God. You've been to church, you've read a verse here or there, but you haven't heard from God. For some of you, you've never heard from God. The natural mind cannot know the things of God. But on this time in history, John the Baptist came on the scene, and here's what the Bible said he was preaching in the wilderness. Let me tell you four things about his life that I observed. Number one is this, he had a unique assignment. Say, Pastor, what was his assignment? Look in verse 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist had the unique assignment to preach. And that preaching was a simple message. You showed up for the meeting in the wilderness, and here was his message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You think, let's take a break. Come back, let's hear him again. You come back in the afternoon after having your five loaves and two fish, and you come back, and guess what happens? John stands up to preach, and you're ready to hear this strange man, and he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then again, you think, well, maybe it'll be different tonight. You come back for the evening service. There he stands up again by the water with the light and and the fire gone. And you say, John, preach. And he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And again, in the morning, you get up one more time, Lord. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Friend, what have you been hearing from this pulpit? Have you not been hearing that repentance must come before awakening? And friend, listen to me. Some of you say, well, preacher, move on. Do like the one guy who'd preached five weeks in a row, John 3, 16, every night. And Dwight L. Moody went to hear him, and he said, Young man, how come you've not moved beyond this? He said, When they get that, I'll go on. America hasn't gotten it yet. And I'm afraid that the church has not gotten it yet. And so the man of God had this unique assignment. Two things about it. It's not in your notes. I want you to know. Two things about it. First of all, he was chosen for it. You see, the Hollywood has robbed us. The, the, the world society has robbed us. When, when we say things like this, they, 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 they think it of terms in secular view. Here's the thing. You have a destiny. The, the hyper-Calvinists took it and drove it the wrong way. The Arminians took it and drove it the other way. But God has a destiny for every life. I believe with all my heart. He had a destiny for John the baptizer. Do you know that John the baptizer, he had a parent who was a priest. He was a poor priest by the name of Zechariah living in Judea. He had a mama by the name of Elizabeth who'd gotten so old she couldn't have a baby. They were beyond that time. And one particular day, by the mercy of God, he was called to go all the way from Judea to Jerusalem to serve in the temple. He goes in and it was a divine appointment, the Bible said. The Bible said that an angel of the Lord spoke to him and he said your wife's going to have a child and listen to me God not only told him that he was going to be born but he said this he will be the one prophesied by Isaiah do you know that during the 400 years of silence now look you look this way for a moment young parents do you know that history records that every every parent was saying could their boy be John the Baptist You see, they wanted to make a difference. Why is it that that young parents today and and those that have teenagers today, that we don't don't pray that way and don't believe that way? That when we raise our kids, the last thing on our mind is that God might call them down and send them somewhere in the world. Listen, Sherry and I, from the moment of conception of all three of our kids and even the ones that God sent to heaven, we prayed that they'd be an instrument in the hand of God. We wish we could live by them. That would be a joy if we could, but we didn't hold them. And they're all over the world now because that's what they're supposed to do with their lives. And so John the baptizer would be born by a miracle and he would have a cousin by the name of Jesus the Christ. He'd have a cousin. I don't know how many times they were together, but I know this, Mom and Dad, you have the responsibility to raise your family in the Word of God. I don't care how old you are, raise them in the Word of God. Can you hear John, uh, excuse me, Zachariah saying to John, Son, it was prophesied about you. The Holy Spirit's on you. You're going to be a Nazarite. You are a Nazarite vow, and you're going to prepare the way for Jesus. Friend, what was the last, when was the last time that you watched the news and wept and looked at your child and say, we've got to go. It was the last time you went to the pregnancy, by the pregnancy center in our city and said, we've got to go. When was the last time that when someone was hurt and someone was broken and bruised and battered, that you didn't just sit there, that you just said to your whole household, we have to go. Some of you today, you have an unusual assignment. You may be a grandparent that nobody that's come after you serve the Lord. Believe God for them. 
Hold on for them. You may be a parent that has a child that won't listen. Believe God for them. Be, be that Zechariah for them. That is your assignment from God. And to do that, you must accept it. Some of you as kids that, that your parents don't go to church, they're in apathy right now. Believe God. You may have a spouse that's not serving God. Believe them. You have a country that's going the wrong way. You can be the change. But you've got to step under God's anointing. See, friend, God can take anybody and change their life if they will accept their assignment. But today, I want to tell you this. It begins, you've got to repent in your wilderness. He was out in the wilderness, but there's something else about him you need to see. He had an unusual appearance. Listen to this now. The Bible says, now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was McDonald's. I changed that last part. Locusts and wild honey. Anybody besides me for years, Brother Dave, did you ever just wonder what in the world why he did all that? I have. Here's what I discovered just this week, and I believe he's right. Dr. Haley, some of you have Haley's Bible commentary, his handbook. Here's what he said. He said he believed that just like people wanted to be John the Baptist, that John the Baptist began to research Elijah. Because Malachi had said he would preach in the spirit of Elijah. He was just like Elijah. Now watch, he didn't dress for downtown, he dressed for the battle. And so just like Elijah in his spirit, you say, why do you feel like you need to emphasize that? Because the Scripture emphasizes it. When a person has been moved by God and changed by God, their appearance is different. The way they conduct themselves, Romans chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, you are now in the spirit of God. The Bible says Colossians 3, 1 through 4, you've now set your mind on things above where Christ is. Your life is now obviously different. By your appearance, people's lives were changed. Do you know that during the Welch revival, there was a drunkard going by a service when they were singing, throw out the lifeline. And you know what he did? He got so under conviction by their appearance that he went in and God sobered him in the service and he got saved and he never drank again. Do you know today that there are people that when they see your appearance, they judge your God based upon your appearance? Based upon what you are doing, the attitude of your life, whether you have the anointing or whether you don't have the anointing, it appears to me that a lot of churches are in the wilderness. It appears to me that a lot of churches today are trying to attract the world with what they already have. My friend, let me tell you something. I want to be in a church that has what the world doesn't have and what the world can have if they'll come to know Jesus Christ. So today we come to this place saying, God, only your anointing. Some of you are going to have to make some adjustments. Some of you are going to have to make some adjustments in your life so that God can use you. Some of you, you may have have this longing inside of you, but you know it's wrong, and you're presently doing it right now. Let me tell you something. You have to fight that because that comes from your old nature and the enemy. Some of you that God has had an assignment for you from the time that you were a little thing, but you never ever in your life surrendered to what it was. Now God says, I'm going to shake things up. I'm going to adjust your life. Let me ask you, what do you want? Some of you cannot go out of here today and to the coffee shop because of your appearance. Not because of your dress, whether you've got blue jeans on, whether they cut up or whether they're straight. Whether your hair is yellow, whether it's blue or gray, or you have no hair. That's not the issue of the day. Whether you have a tie on or whether you don't have a tie the issue is your spiritual appearance. You see, some of you, listen to me, God's calling you to go to the coffee shop, but you know the truth is they'd laugh at you because the Bible you tell them to read, you hadn't read. The God you tell them to serve, you're not serving. The one that you you are paying and tithing in that church to do, you're not on the team with them, but God has called you today. He says, you're an unlikely person, an unlikely time, but if you'll just make some adjustment, I'll change your appearance. I'll change your appearance from the inside out, your attitude. Some of you are one appearance changed from the Holy Spirit. To be a man or a woman or a boy or girl, that God can use in the most crucial time in the history of the world. John the Baptist came at the most ungodly and wicked time in the world. And God said, son, I'm going to use you to prepare the way for the Son of God. And so what I want to do is give you the assignment. I'm going to let your appearance be so radical that people are going to be drawn. Which is the third thing. He had an unusual appeal. There was something that, that was appealing about him in verse 5. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. Now, let, 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 this, let this sink in for a moment, friend. You've got to grasp this. John was not preaching on a major road. He might be like they are out at Rock Springs. 
He might be like they are in other places of the world, not on a major fairway. He was out in the wilderness, but he was there under the anointing of God, preaching the Word of God, and people just started to come. So let me ask you, what are people coming up to you and asking? I want to tell you right now, if ever there was a time in the history of America that you have an opportunity under the anointing to be God's hands and feet, it's now. Because I promise you, if you go up this afternoon to some restaurant in our city or to another city, sit down, they're not talking about the ball game this afternoon. They're talking about whether the world comes to an end. I promise you tomorrow when you go wherever you go, maybe to a doctor's office, somebody will be wanting to know what's going on in the news. This is our opportunity. Now listen, and some of you got to come out of the wilderness. Do you see if you're in the wilderness long enough, God comes and shakes it up. Some of you may be having pleasure in sin, but that season will end. And if you and I, mom and dad, are not ready, grandparents, siblings, friends, if we're not where we need to be under the anointing of God, fulfilling our assignment with the right appearance, they'll go right on by us. People are running for their lives. We have no tomorrow. And John the Baptist was preaching, and they were going out to him, and they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. How did this happen, preacher? John said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus had come. If they wanted to follow him, they couldn't follow him in ungodliness, so they'd have to repent. They'd have to change direction. And John says, if you repent of your sins, Jesus Christ is coming. You can receive him, and I'm going to baptize you as a testimony that you believe he has come. But friend, today, you need to do more than just a physical baptism. You need a spiritual baptism. There needs to be that moment in your life that God opens the door for your heart and changes. Listen to what the Scripture says, Isaiah 43 and 28. For my own sake, I am the one who blots out your transgressions. And I will remember your sin no more. Whatever you came in here with today, you may be in an unlikely time and an unlikely choice, but God can change your life. Jesus is appealing to you today to come to him. And church, God's appealing to some of us today to come back to the anointing that he has. Some of you need to step into it for the first time in your life. You even now don't have a clue what I'm talking about. If you went this entire week and did not see what was going on in the world and wept not once, not once, there's something wrong in your heart. Some of you are hanging out with people who, listen to me, are not informed. If you have lived this week together and did not know the mess in our schools in the country, the state of our political and spiritual state in this country, and if it did not bother you and you did not respond to that, friend, this, I, I feel so sorry for you because if it continues the way it is, there will be a moment that the church will have to grow underground so that we can minister above ground. There will be a moment in time, if I live long enough, that to believe the Bible, that means you'll go to jail. But if we sit around as a church and just allow it to happen while I'm doing my own thing, you say, preacher, are you, what are you talking about? I'm saying this, if you're in retirement, come out. If you're in retirement, come out. If you're planning to retire, don't. You say, preacher, you have no right to tell me that. I don't have a right to tell you anything other than God's Word. And I'm telling you this, this is a time not for the faint or for the weak, but for the warrior. And I'm not saying not, not retire from your job. I'm saying don't retire from your faith. And don't retire from your fight. Students, now is the time to fight through whatever it is that you're fighting through and to submit to God. It's time for our staff. I've challenged our staff to let people repent and don't make it easier for them. You've got to go through this time of hurting. God is rearranging everything right now. And I'm just saying to God, God, I'm yours. God, I am yours. I want this appeal. This last thing I want to tell you is this, that John the Baptist had an unusual approach. He gave it all. He put his life on the line in verse 7. He saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to him to the baptism. Now the Pharisees were the religious part of the Jewish group. The Sadducees were the political side. So you had the church and the government. They were both coming together. Look at America to now. The church and the government where it stands. And he said this to them, glad you're here today we got a seat right down front. He didn't say that. We, we, we need you. We need you on our team. We, we, want, to be, we want to be really quiet. We, we just love you. No, he said, you brood of vipers. Whoa. You want to make friends and influence people? Just walk up to him and say, you a den of snakes. I mean, just say, what's he doing? Here's what he's relating. They had poisoned politically, 
and spiritually the world around them. And friend, today we cannot start in the White House. We better start in the church house. And it's time that pastors in America get right with God. It's time that denominational leaders get right or get out. It's time today that seminarians get right, the leaders and the teachers in colleges. It's time that in the pew in America today that we realize that the sin in us has to be changed by God. We must have a different approach. The approach is to tell the truth. Did you hear me? America's not going to heaven. The church is. Romania is not going to heaven. Malawi is not going to heaven. The church of Jesus Christ is going to heaven. And if you're holding more around a flag than you are your faith, friend, you've got the wrong approach. I love this country and I'm thankful for this country, but the hope of this country is not a flag. It is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Young parents in this room, raise your kids for God. Let them know. Sit them in front of the TV. And explain to them. I'm not wanting you to show them graphic scenes, but sit them in front of the TV. Sit your grandkids down and say, do you know what's going on around the world? Prepare them. Give them a biblical knowledge of what's going on around so that when it comes time for them to, to combat the world. You see, some of these petty issues, it really don't matter tomorrow if our kids wear the designer clothes or they wear them from Walmart. You see, John understood it. He said this to them. He said to them in verse 7, Who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? He said, Here you are teaching. Here you are politically leading. Who warns you? I can tell you this morning that I'm certainly far from a perfect pastor. The team that serves around me sometimes probably wonders why I am the pastor. But I'll tell you this, I'm innocent of the blood of all men. For week after week and year after year, I have told you that repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And there's one way to be saved, and that is through Jesus Christ. And I've told you this with all my heart, that God is coming back, and you should, verse 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. A fruit is a changed life. The Bible says this, that John says, do not presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. Friend, don't, don't presume that all those years you've got in the church means you're going to heaven. Don't don't presume that that before you were okay with God. He said this, For I tell you, God is able to to raise these stones up, the children of Abraham, to replace them. In other words, those of you that have joined this church in the seven years that we've been a part of this church, thank you. Those of you that were here before and are here now, thank you. But God is raising up now. And some of you in this room, today is your day to be raised up and accounted as a member in the body of Christ. Do it today. Others of you, it's time that you raise up and come into the family of God. God's raising up stones. You know what that means for us? That's somebody who was hard-hearted, somebody that was mean, somebody that was wicked, somebody that was a rebel, shook their fist at God. But God came into their life and changed them, and they got born again. God gave them a heart of flesh. And today is your day. You see, today you can change the world. And listen to me, John says this, he says, God will raise them up. I baptize you, now notice in verse 11, with water for repentance. But he who's coming after me is mightier than I. Have I told you yet Jesus is coming again? It may be this year, I don't know. But I know this, this is my time. And I want to be found working when He comes. I want to be found reaching when He comes. I want to be found ready when He comes. I don't have anything left. And He says, He who's coming is mightier. It all boils down to this. Here's our conclusion. Some questions you might put before God. Number one, why me, Lord? God, why would you use me? Why me, Lord? Why me, Lord? Why me? This past Wednesday morning in our men's Bible study, I asked the guys, 20-plus guys in the room, I said, how many of you grew up having the Bible in the church in your home less than a third? If you're in this room and you've grown up with a Bible in your home and you've got to go to church, let me tell you something. Listen to me. Don't waste what you've been given because God has ordained that there would be an assignment for my life and yours. Second, you ought to say today, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Mark Linton and for every sheriff who's ever led. Thank you for every sergeant and every private and every enlisted person that ever went overseas and defended our freedom. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for our founding fathers who were certainly not perfect and a lot of things that they did wrong, but there are a lot of things that they did right. One nation, one under God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that I'm still preaching today and I have a church that loves me. A church is coming to. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Have you got a reason to thank Him today? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that people love me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. When I'm crying for others, I'm shouting. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. John the Baptist would have a short ministry. But listen to him. You hear what he said? Use me, Lord. That's the last point of this thing. Use me, Lord. God, use me. Thank you for taking the time to find God's answers to life's greatest issues. We hope that you would reach out to us at info at jacksonfbc.com with your questions and check out more of our ministries at jacksonfbc.com.